Millennials Online. Good morning. We are so glad that you are with us today. It is a great day to worship the Lord together. Awesome. Laura, we are so glad that you are here today joining us. So welcome. And to those of you who are joining us this morning, welcome to you as well. Whether you are an online campus regular or if this is your very first week or if you're just visiting this week, Whichever camp you may be in, welcome. We are so glad that you are here and we are thankful for you. So we are nearing the end of our masterclass series, which means that we are nearing the end of summer as well, which is absolutely wild. <laughs> but Laura, how has this series been to you? What are we gonna be hearing about this morning? Yes, I've really enjoyed taking this expository look, just walking through the book of Mark. And so today we're in chapter 14. And chapter 14 is a lot of the Easter story that we hear um, at that time of year. But the thing is, that's not just an Easter story, right? It's the story of our faith, and it's the story that's applicable to us all year long. And so in 14, we're going to look at the Last Supper. We're going to look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we're going to see Jesus when he stands before the Sanhedrin. Our family pastor, Chase Baker, is teaching today, and there is a lot to unpack and learn together. Absolutely, it should be a powerful message this morning and we are so glad that you're here to hear this message. And we just hope and pray that this series has been a challenging one to you, but in, in the best way possible that it has challenged you in how you can grow to be a more devoted follower of Jesus by learning from the master himself, Jesus, as we've, as we've walked alongside the disciples through the gospel of Mark together. So we just hope and pray that this series has been a great one and we, can, and we hope that you'll just continue as we close out this series in the next coming weeks. You know, I have the privilege of serving as our Care and Connections pastor, and we just want to take a moment to share what that means for you as an online campus, because we want to care and connect with you as well. So be sure today, if you are newer, to fill out a card, give us information. There's a place where you can share an online prayer request, and someone from our team will follow up with you. Our staff team will pray for you. Um, so please take the time to do that. In addition to that, if there's a way we can help you move forward, whatever that means where, where you are in life, we would be honored to do that. And so here in our Nashville area, we're starting care classes in August and we will have several options, divorce care, grief share. So be sure to check those out online. And if you're not local, then please let us know. Say, hey, I would really love help with this. And we can try to help connect you to a local resource for you, whether that's counseling or a group that's nearby. But we wanna help you um, as we all move towards healing and hope in Christ. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing that, Laura, and different ways that you all can get connected to our care opportunities, as well as we would love to pray with you this morning. We've got online hosts in the chat who would absolutely love to hear what you're walking through just so that they can come alongside you and pray with you this morning. So another next step that you can take, and ladies, this is specifically for you, are midweek groups that are coming up. So we've got midweek online groups this fall coming up starting September 7th. We'll be walking through the Encountering God study by Kelly Minter. I've heard it's a really awesome study that I'm really excited to be learning from as we walk through different spiritual disciplines and how, ladies, we can build community even if it's online. And we just had an incredible feedback just on our, our past online studies and how they've just really impacted some of you ladies who have been joining us online. So this, this fall coming up, so starting September 7th, we've got two different opportunities. We'll continue with our Facebook group throughout the week to stay connected, but we'll also have a midday and an evening session for you all to get involved with. So head to rollinghills.church slash women to get all the details about our online groups. And we would absolutely love for you ladies to jump in and to get involved and take a next step in your faith in that way. Fantastic. And another way you can connect and go further is by taking our Explore Rolling Hills class. And you can even do that online. There's a version that's kind of on demand. You can go to our Explore Rolling Hills page and you can walk through, I think there are three separate videos. And we just share a lot of who we are, our story and what our beliefs are and ways to get connected. And it's an awesome way to learn more and to hear from other staff members as well. So if you have time um, or questions, that would be a great place to start. Awesome. Well, I think that's it. So let's worship together this morning.
morning, church family. It is so good to be with you today. Will you stand up with us? We get to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of your life and my life. And we get to celebrate who he is. So we're going to worship with all that we are this morning. Amen. All right, sing this with us. So he. Worship to our King today. Come on, church.
comes a portion to our Father. Amen. Come on, we lift up our banners. We lift our banners. with you today. If you are joining us online, welcome. Maybe you are checking us out for the first time, or maybe you join us every week online and you live somewhere else in our country or in our world, or maybe you attend one of our Middle Tennessee campuses, but you just aren't here today. Whatever the case, know that you are very much a part of what's happening here. And our prayer is that you will just fully engage in what the Lord has for you. If you are newer, whether you're watching or here in Franklin, we would love to be able to tell you what's happening here. And you can let us do that by giving us information, fill out your connection card at the bottom of the worship guide or online, and then we can follow up this week and just tell you what the Lord is doing in this place. And in that same place, you can share prayer requests. We would be honored to pray with you and to pray for you this week and what's happening in your world. Well, we are on the back half of summer, but it is still very much summer. And we have a team that's actually on their way home right now from the Amazon. I think we have some pictures. They served this week and they did a pastor's conference in Brazil. You can see Nick Allen, Jason Hale, Eric Rhodes, just some of our staff team that went, and they get to go and love these pastors who literally serve at the ends of the earth, places where you and I will never go. But because of your generosity and your prayers, we are able to support them and love them and cheer them on in Jesus' name. So it has just been an awesome summer for them this week. And we are concluding our Do Good Local Summer Challenge today. Thank you. We have been wrapping up by focusing on education. So for all the school supplies that you've brought, we just say thank you um, for investing in our community. We want to continue to pray for schools as they begin to ramp up here in the next few weeks. And today, our family pastor, Chase Baker, will be teaching in our series, Masterclass on the Book of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 14, and he said, Laura, it has 72 verses. So get ready. Get your pens ready. Get the app ready. He does a fantastic job, and there's a lot for us to learn. And as we continue to worship right now, we want to celebrate with two baptisms. So if you'll turn your attention to the screens. Hi, I'm Ashlyn, and I am so excited to be here today with my grandma, Barbara, who is ready to take her next step of faith by being baptized. Grandma, being baptized is not the end of your spiritual journey, but just the beginning, and tells the story of how Jesus saved you. So in front of our church friends and family, I want to ask you today, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you promise to follow him for the rest of your life? I do. Then as your granddaughter and sister in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Hi, church family. My name is Ashley Morgan, and I serve as your middle school resident. Today, I have Kennedy Thrash here with me. Kennedy decided at Beach Week that she wanted to take the next step, step in faith, and I'm so honored that I get to stand here and do this with you. So, Kennedy, I just have one question for you. Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Okay. Upon that confession, as your sister in Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nothing like baptism, like seeing people recognizing the Lord as just the Lord of their lives. As we stand and continue and worship, I want you guys to think about that, that the Lord of the universe, Jesus Christ, he has died for you. He is the King of Kings and he loves you and he loves me. He died for us. Let's continue in worship and sing that to him today. In the darkness, we will wait without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and the prophets to a virgin gave the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the Despise the cross, yes. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. No weakness was our salvation, yes. Jesus for our Savior. Shall not fail, but he's burning in his name, in his free. 
You know, so often when I walk back into a room like this, um, so much of what I do just becomes routine and I have to actually remind myself <laughs> that my worship, it's a recognition of who God is and then it's a, a turning of my affection and my adoration and my, my devotion towards Him. And um, we're talking Mark, Mark 14 today and later in the chapter there's this woman who's pouring out this perfume on Jesus' feet and you know everyone in the room is trying to admonish her and, and Jesus stops them and corrects them and says that, that she is doing the right thing, that she recognizes who He is, that He's, he's the King where his kingdom will, will never end. He's, he's the true king. He's the good father. He's the good, um, good God. And so she pours out the whole bottle on his feet. And that just strikes me um, because I so often give God just a little bit. I give him what's, what's available right now, what I have left, um, maybe from the day, maybe not giving him the first fruits of my life. And I come into this room and I see us all standing here and, and worshiping this, this good God. And I just feel like, man, that's our challenge to take recognition of who God is, that he's a good God and a good mood who loves his kids and then turning every bit of our, our life towards him. And what that does is it reorients our, our life. It brings us into alignment with the king. And when we do that, I believe that not just this room will shift and we'll see a change in this church, but we'll see a change in our city, in the schools, in businesses, but we'll see a change also in the states and in this country and in this world because that's the way Jesus moves on this earth, like a, like a mustard seed that starts small, but with every knee bowing, every tongue confessing that he is Lord, we will see his kingdom come and his will being done throughout the whole world. And so my challenge to us this morning, as we're all standing here doing the, the thing that we came here to do, and, and maybe some of us feeling that routine, is that we would actually stop, recognize God for who He is, and the very breath in our lungs would turn back praise to Him, to acknowledge Him and worship Him and reorient our lives to Him. Does that make sense? You with me? All right. Okay, good. You give life 
We're the church. We're going to declare this to be true. And so let's pour out the whole bottle, all right? Give me everything you got. And let's just, let's worship the good king. Pray this with me. Just say, Jesus, we love you. Come on, every voice. Jesus, we love you. We worship you. Continue to walk with us, Lord. We pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. 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 You guys can have a seat. Good morning. How's everybody doing? It's almost the end of summer, and your kids are about ready to go back to school. Wow. Yeah, so we are in uh, week 14 of our series called Master Class, and there are 16 weeks, so we're almost to the end, and then we're starting a new series. But we have really been um, really uh, incredibly grateful for this summer and all that God has been doing and I don't know about you, but your summer is probably like mine where it's been packed. It's been full of different things, different activities. And you're trying to get your kids from this camp to this camp. And this, this uh, we've done like an art camp and a dance camp and all those things. And so we're doing di- different camps and different activities throughout. So you're trying to figure out different things to do. Well, there was one uh, weekday that Courtney and I decided to take a day trip with my daughter, Kit. And so we decided to go to the Huntsville Space uh, and Rocket Museum, or the centers, Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And I don't know if you've been there before or not, but we, she loves space. We love that about her. She loves the, God's creation and outer space and all that stuff. So, so we decided to take her to this space center. And so we uh, got down to the space center. It's really, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a, a fun place. You go in and there's lots of spacey stuff, but then you go into spacey stuff. I'm really technical here. Um, and then you go into this giant room about like this, and, and there's different activities for kids to do along the way. And so they're doing these different, or she's doing these af- af- activities, and then we make our way to a ride. 
and it's called G-Force. I call it the death machine. <laughs> and it's a two-seater. And what you need to know about this G-Force is it, it does this, it spins, and I'm getting dizzy even doing this. And so, so I don't do spinny things anymore. I don't know about you, but I feel like you reach a certain age where spinny things just doesn't, it doesn't work out well for you. And, and, and unfortunately, Kit had to have somebody go with her on this ride, right? And so I'm looking at Courtney, my wife, and thinking, you're going to go. <laughs> and she's looking at me saying, no, you're going to go. And so we're having this uh, argument without having, saying any words. You've ever had those things? And so, um, so the only other option we had is to leave it up to Kit to make the decision about who rides what. And so we, we say, oh, Kit, who do you want to ride? And I'm leaning back like, <laughs> you know, to, go. And uh, a kid out of spite chose me. <laughs> and so, and so we, uh, we, at this point, I've got to get hype. I've got to get it together. Like I am all in at this moment of time. There's nothing that you could say to me to convince me otherwise. If I'm going to do it, we're going to do it. And Courtney comes over. We're standing in line waiting to get on this ride. Courtney comes over and she is the voice of reason, right? And she's saying, okay, this is going to be a long day. It's at the beginning of the day. How about we just wait until the end of the day before we get on this ride? That way, if your day's ruined, all of our days are not ruined. And so let's wait to ruin your day till the end of the day. So, <laughs> so um, but I didn't hear a word of it. At this point, I'm locked in, and all I could hear in the back of my head was this music. That's all I could hear. Like, everything else, I did not pay attention to. I was locked in. Don't think, just do. Have you seen the new uh, Matt uh, Top Gun? Don't think, just do. And so that's, that's me. So I'm waiting in line, and we're waiting to get on this death trap. And so we get into the death trap. It's called G-Force, but I call it death trap. All right, so we're sitting there, and I'm looking her in the eye. And you know what? I'm bringing the power, okay? I want to show her what power looks like, what dad power looks like. And it's one of those things, you know, at Disneyland where the teacups and you spin it yourself, you know that talking about? So, um, so I had to bring the power. So uh, immediately, I'm spinning this thing, and I'm looking at her. And this is a, a video of the ride. Courtney captured a video. So this is us. We're going around and around and around and around and around. And, uh, and then let me show you a close-up picture of me. The reason why I had to do that is because I didn't want to throw up on my little girl and traumatize her for life. It was brutal. And I'm yelling to the guy, the instructor. I'm like, get us out of here. I can't do this anymore. And so we stopped and my day was ruined. And, um, and so all that to say is that we all, no matter what situation that we find ourselves in, we all respond in different ways to those situations, a flight, fight or freeze kind of mentality, or maybe somebody's a, really, a little bit nervous or somebody's recklessly running into things, or somebody is the voice of reason, or somebody is the person who's offering the wisdom and guidance in the whole situation. Well, I believe all throughout the Bible, there are people who respond in different ways to different situations. In fact, I believe there are people that respond to Jesus in different ways. And what we find in Mark chapter 14 is is three different people responding in three different ways to the person of Jesus. And let me just tell you, all of us have to, have to respond to Jesus. We don't have a choice in this matter. We all have, a, have to respond to Jesus in some way. The question is, how are you going to respond to Jesus? Our response to him will ultimately determine what we believe about him. So with that said, let's pray. Father, we come before you. Um, ready and willing to engage your words. I pray that we are forever changed by them. God, use your words to make us more, look more like you. And God, help us, draw us to yourself today. And God, may we forever be changed by them. God, we love you so much. Thank you for this opportunity to worship together as a church family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we get to Mark chapter 14. If you have your copy of scriptures, you can open it up. It's going to be on the screen or your mobile device. 
Um, So here we go. So the scene has been set in this chapter. We are currently uh, moving on to the Passover celebration. We're coming to the end of Jesus's life here on this earth, um, his earthly ministry. And so we're right around the Passover celebration at this point in time. And we find ourselves in in Bethany, in the town of Bethany. Jesus was accustomed to going to this town of Bethany. And during Passover, he would stay there while, uh, while during the day he would journey to Jerusalem to teach. And at night he would go and find respite and go and find rest. He made his way one night back to Bethany where they were having a dinner party for Jesus. And Simon the leper was there and he hosted the dinner party that they had for Jesus. And and it's said to be that that, uh, he, he was healed of leprosy. And many people believe that Jesus healed him. So it was an appreciation dinner for all that Jesus had done for for everybody. So a lot of of friends showed up at the house. And so they all gathered at the house. And then something remarkable happens. Verse 3. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon a leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus's head. So here we have a woman who is unnamed by Mark, but it's most likely Mary. Mary, the sister of Martha, okay, and sister of Lazarus. And, and you guys know the story of uh, Mary, Mary and Martha. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. Mary was, or uh, Martha was busy doing other things, and Mary was intently focusing on Jesus. This this is most likely that Mary. Mary took out an alabaster flask used for the finest perfumes and ointments. I mean, this was expensive. It contained pure nard, and it was found uh, from a plant in India. That's what made it so expensive. It was very rare. And so the, she had a narrow neck of a bottle, right, for the perfume. And that was uh, restricting the flow of the, the, of the ointment or the perfume. And so what, she, what did she do? She breaks it so that it, she would get a full flow and she poured it all over Jesus's head. And verse five tells us this was really expensive. It was worth about a year's wages of salary. Think about that. What she did, she held nothing back. And why was she doing it? Because anointing especially of this caliber and this level, anointing was reserved for three things. For kings, for priests, and the last thing is to prepare people for burial. This is what happens next. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why waste, why this waste of perfume? If you could be only sold for more than a year's rate, if you'd be sold for more than a year's rate wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them at any point that you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured the perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my what? Burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told of her in memory of her. Caring for the poor was important to Jesus. Jesus wasn't denying that. That's, that's something ordinary. That's an ordinary duty for any believer is to care for the poor. Jesus wasn't devalue the, devaluing the importance of giving to the poor. It was essential but what we see here was this was there's something that was happening that was out of the ordinary that required an extraordinary response. And Mary was up for the task. She actually gave everything to Jesus. She poured out everything in devotion to him. And then we see the, the disciples responding, why are you wasting this perfume? You know what Jesus is hearing? Why are you wasting this perfume on me? He responds in three ways. Leave her alone. She did what she could more than you. She did what she could, and what she did was going to be told about forever for the advancement of the gospel. Those three things. Jesus was frustrated with his disciples, and get this. uh, Jesus was in a house with people who, who, who were the closest to him, and yet still didn't recognize 
who was sitting there before them. You see, we noticed that this woman set the example for how we should respond. A woman in the culture who didn't really have any rights, a woman in this culture, in this social setting, she would have been asked to sit in the other room. She wouldn't have been allowed in this social gathering, but Mary broke through that mold. I, I, I'm gonna be in here and I'm gonna be next to Jesus and there's nothing that you can do to stop me. I'm gonna be next to Jesus. She broke through the mold. She wasn't a religious person. She, she didn't have any credentials. She did, she, what, what she did was really unexpected. She was out of place. She did the unthinkable and the unacceptable, yet she got it. See, Mary, the first response, Mary was selflessly devoted. She was selflessly devoted. She modeled what selfless devotion looked like, and she knew that it was going to be costly. You see, Jesus should compel his followers to selfless devotion. He should compel his followers to selfless devotion. And let me just tell you this. Selfless devotion, if we're moving on, selfish devotion is costly. It's going to cost us something. You see, anything worth anything will always cost you something. Anything worth anything will always cost you something. Think about the things that are important in your life. Think about your relationships. Think about your marriage. Think about your kids. Are your kids costly? Think about your business. Think about those things that are value to you. And here's the thing about selfless devotion that's costly. It's going to cost you financially. It's going to cost you financially. And when we get to the point where we recognize, God, this is yours. You've graciously given me financially, and I, I give it back to you. I, I, give, I give it back to you, and you can command it or direct me to do whatever you choose with it. It's yours. See, I, I think probably most of us would have sold the perfume, maybe given 10% to the, the Lord, given 10% percent to the church and pocketed the rest to spend on getting the, the latest model mule or something else. Right? But Mary's sacrifice, she, she had a sacrifice. It cost her something. And I think that's why Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where your treasure is, there your heart. He doesn't need your wealth. In fact, he can, do, he can do this thing without our wealth. He doesn't need his wealth to accomplish his purposes on this earth. What he knows is he wants your heart. And what he, what he knows, he knows this. He knows that our wealth and our heart are closely connected. It's going to cost us financially. The second thing it'll cost us, it'll cost us socially. We live in a world that doesn't understand Jesus. You can hang your hat on Jesus, right? If you hang your hat on Jesus, if you stand up for Jesus, then what you may find is that it may remove you from some social circles. Think about your kids. We're about to send them to school. Uh, we're about to send my baby girl to school, formal education for the first time in kindergarten. Like she is, uh, and we're, we're excited for her. But, but like you, probably if you're a parent in your room, you have the specific prayers that you're praying for them. And some of those prayers may look like this. You hope, that, you hope that they find friends who accept them, who will love them, who will challenge them, who will be there for them. Like all of those kind of things. We hope that that happens for them. But we also, we pray that they will be courageous enough when faced with making the right or wrong decisions, that they make the right decisions no matter the cost. Like we're praying that over our children. Why don't we say the same prayers to ourselves? Because as adults, we can fall into those same categories and maybe being a part of some social circles that whenever we say yes to Jesus, it may, it may push us out of some of those social circles. It will also cost you some criticism. I don't know anybody who wants, enjoys criticism, do you? I don't. I want people to tell me I'm awesome all the time. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like waiting on a pause. Um, and I don't know if you've hung around Pastor Jeff or not, but after I hang out with Pastor Jeff, I feel awesome all the time. He, he makes me feel like a hundred bucks. And, and, and I, we just want to feel that, but we don't want criticism, especially when we're criticized for, some, for, for somebody else. 
Like when we're criticized because of somebody else, following Jesus will cost us some criticism. And here's what I want you to keep in mind. Mary was criticized by those who are thought to be closest to Jesus. I think you can expect that as well. Expect some criticism. So those three things that you can expect, uh, it costs financially, socially, some criticism. But, but here's the thing. Selfless devotion comes from knowing Jesus personally. It, it comes from knowing Jesus personally. When something is personal to you, it mu- moves you beyond thought to action. You have to do something about it. You see, you can be in proximity to Jesus, but still not know who he is. You can be in proximity to the things of God, but still miss him. You can, might go to the studies. You might go sit in a worship service. You might be a part of a community, but, but we can also still miss it. You can say that you follow Jesus, but your actions are far from Jesus. You can claim Jesus as Savior, but not live as though he is your king. What Mary teaches us is what it looks like to love Jesus recklessly, with reckless abandon, to respond to what Jesus has done. When you really see Jesus, who Jesus is, it seems like it's the only response that's appropriate. So that's the first response, is selfless devotion. And then we move to the second response, to a second character in this, in this passage, It's an unlikely character. We don't like to talk about this character, but this is Judas. We don't oftentimes like to talk about Judas because of of what he did, but I think it's appropriate for us to talk about today because oftentimes we can have this sort of response. And then verse 10, after the dinner, is what kind of happened. Then Judas Iscariot, one one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted, of course. To hear this and promise to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Judas directly opposed. He directly opposed. Judas, after seeing all that Jesus has done, all the miracles, hearing from Jesus in his teaching, receiving an invitation to come and follow him, what did he do? He responded with betrayal. And the question is why? Was it wealth and greed? Probably, possibly, was it to gain some political power in that day? And he knew that whenever he turned Jesus over to the authorities, it would give him some sort of political power in that day. Possibly, was it because he just wanted some earthly gain and he couldn't see Jesus for who he is? Maybe. All that to say is opposition comes in all forms. It comes in all forms. Unfortunately, if we don't address the deepest need within us, then some people can fall in the same category as Judas and oppose. And maybe you find yourselves um, uh, not knowing that you're opposing. You're doing unintentionally. Maybe you yourself or you have family members or you have friends or maybe even some of your children are in opposition and they've fallen into this category. That's why if you're a follower of Jesus, what we tell you all the time is guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else for from it everything else flows. Guard your heart and your mind. Get into a community of faith that people are going to encourage you and love you and build you up and go to battle with you and link arms with you. The other thing is, don't let sin fester. I think when we let sin fester and we don't address it, it can isolate us. And that's what the enemy wants to do is he wants to isolate us to where we, we have no hope, to where we, it's a domino effect. But, but the, the Bible says, confess your sins to one another. Confess your sins to, to one another. But let me address the opposite side of opposition. We may find ourselves in opposition to, to Jesus at some point, but, but what about if opposition comes your way? What if somebody opposes you? What's your response Because I can tell you this, this is what Jesus says about opposition. He said this, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of this world. That is why the world hates you. Maybe there's people that don't see the point 
of what we're doing. Maybe you're in the room and you don't see the point. You think this is a fairy tale. Maybe you come across people in your life that are not just not for Jesus, they are anti-Jesus. And they might seem a little bit aggressive, but as a Christ follower, how should our response be? What should we do in response to people who oppose? You see, following Jesus will elicit opposition. So how did Jesus respond? When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. Verse 18, while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who's eating with me. Jesus knew exactly who would betray him, but you know what he didn't do? He didn't single anybody out. He didn't point, he didn't call out any names. He knew exactly who was gonna betray him. If that would that'd be me, it'd been totally different, right? But you know what Jesus did before this moment? This is, this is unbelievable. But before this moment, he knew he was gonna betray him, yet he got down on his hands and in his knees and he looked Judas in the eye and he washed his feet. He served him. He loved him. He washed his feet. The next time we see Judas and Jesus, Jesus together, keep in mind this, next time we see them together, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. He was about to get rest, arrested because Judas was gonna turn him in and Judas comes walking up to Jesus. Jesus looks him in the face and he responds in this way, do what you came for, friend. Jesus calls him friend. Jesus' response was gentle and kind. In just a few weeks, we're gonna start a series on the fruits of the Spirit. And throughout Jesus' life, he displays these fruits of the Spirit time and time again, even when the situation deserved a harsh response. But here's what you need to know. And here's what I think this this text is teaching us. Our response to opposition will determine how people see and experience God. Our response to opposition will determine how people see and experience God. God, a truthful comment done from a wrong spirit is still wrong because it's not done out of love. A truthful post done on social media said out of spite is still wrong, but I gave it the hashtag Jesus forever. But I gave it the hashtag, what would Jesus do? It's still wrong. It almost makes it worse because through our actions and our attitudes and our our words, it determines how people see and experience God. Jesus' response to opposition was not reactive. It was proactive. The goal was to draw people to himself. But here's the thing. When people get to know Jesus, what they oftentimes realize, it wasn't Jesus that they opposed. It was people who misrepresented Jesus. Did you get that? When people get to know Jesus, it's oftentimes not Jesus who they oppose. It's people who misrepresented Jesus. It's people who claim Jesus, but like Pastor Mike said last week, these people didn't love like Jesus. So that's the second response. The third response comes from a character in, I love this guy, he's Peter. Peter was, uh, was all heart and half mind. He was a maverick from Top Gun. He was don't think, just do kind of guy. And so he was fully in, right? And we, at some, one point in time, uh, early in Jesus' ministry, Jesus sent his disciples out to do ministry. They came back and they gave a report and Jesus says, who do people say that I am? You remember that? And, and a couple guys were like, you are Elijah the prophet. You are a teacher. And then Peter stands up and said, you are, the, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You're like, man, he got it. Man, he is fully in. And then you read Mark chapter 14. And you're like, what went wrong? See, if you continue throughout the story, the next night after the, the anointing of the woman of Mary, Jesus met with his disciples for a last meal. We call that the Last Supper. That's where he does communion with his disciples. That's why we do it today, because Jesus took elements, bread and wine, that represents what he's going to do on the cross. And so he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, uh, took it, gave it to his disciples, said, this is gonna be my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And that's why we do it today. He did, did the same with the wine. This can be my blood shed for you, for, for, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. 
And so right after that moment, it's really fascinating. Right after that moment, you think it's a kumbaya moment. They're all together. They're all unified. But right after that moment, Jesus speaks these words to the disciples. You will all fall away from me. Ah. For it is written, I will strike the head of the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. It's coming from the prophet Zechariah. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if, I, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you will, fi- you will disown me three times. But Peter emphatically, he said this, even if I have to die with you. It's like so dramatic. I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Peter was overly confident in himself. And next thing you know, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're being, Jesus is being arrested. And what happens? They scatter. They're gone. There's nowhere to be fine. And then Jesus was taken before the Sanhedrin uh, court, the Supreme Court of Israel, which included the high priest. And Peter decided to follow from a distance. He's like sneaking around different places, trying not to be seen. And while Peter was doing that, Jesus was standing before the Sanhedrin court, before the high priest, telling them that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And ultimately, by the way, that's what got him crucified. Next thing you know, we see Peter in the courtyard, and this is what happens. Verse 66, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You're also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about. He said, and went into the entryway. And when uh, the servant girl saw him, uh, him there, she said again to those around him, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a while, those standing near Jesus said to, uh, standing near, uh, said to Peter, surely you're one of them for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses and swore to him. He began to cuss like a sailor because if he could cuss like a sailor, then surely they would think they would leave him alone. That he's nothing to do with Jesus. So he's cussing at him. And this is what happens. He said, I don't know this man that you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crows the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. The end. That's the end of the chapter. Um, Peter in this moment did the very thing that he said he wasn't going to do. He publicly denied Jesus and all this shame and guilt fell on him. And he imagined in his moment, he's like, how could I have messed up so badly? How could I be such a failure? And now Jesus is gone. You see, Peter willfully disobeyed. Peter willfully disobeyed. And we can think that we, we are different from Peter, but the reality is we are just like Peter. We have all willfully disobeyed our creator of the universe, our holy God. We've all willfully, in fact, uh, Romans 3.23 says this, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. We've all fallen into that boat. But here's the question. What does God think of you when you are a failure? When you are filled with shame and guilt over past sins? I believe God thinks of you the same way he thought of Peter. We continue on. The next thing that you know is that Jesus was put to death. He was buried and he he was resurrected. And then he began to show up to uh, different people. He began to show up to his disciples and and show up to uh, uh, over hundreds of people, over 500 people at this moment uh, moment in time. But he had unfinished business to do with Peter. The elephant in the room has yet to be addressed with Peter, but, but Jesus was, was going to be, be getting his opportunity to address Peter. Then we go to John chapter 21. The disciples find, find themselves by the Sea of Galilee. While they're waiting on Jesus, they were by the Sea of Galilee on, on the shoreline. And so they're waiting on Jesus, and, and Peter is, is thinking, still in shame and still in guilt. And he sees fishing boats, and he says, you know what? I'm going to go fishing. Do you know what he really was meaning right there? What he really meant? I'm going to go back to being a fisherman. He's going back to his old career. This discipleship thing, this disciple thing, 
I'm not worthy of. I'm going to go be a fisherman. And his other disciples began to follow him. And they went out and they fished all night long. And they caught not a single thing. How terrible of a fishing day that would be. And so they, 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 they didn't catch anything. Then morning came and they're still casting. And it came time for them to, hey, let's, let's call it quits, guys. They we're not catching a thing. And then they see somebody on the shoreline. It was Jesus. They couldn't recognize him, but he was 100 yards away. And this guy on the shoreline says this, friends, yelling at him, friends, haven't you any fish? He knows the answer. He's just poking fun at him. Like, why in the world would he say that? But then he says, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So that's all it's going to take, huh? Here to here? You think that's all it's going to take? Look, look, we, we've done everything else. Let's just do it. So they put their nets on the other side of the boat, and fish began to jump into the net, and it was too heavy for them to pull up on the boat. Then somebody pointed out and said, that's the Lord. I wanted to pause here for a second because, you know, this is not the first time that he did this exact same miracle. Do you know the, the first time he did this miracle? The first time that he did this miracle was the time where he first called Peter to come follow him and be his disciple. Jesus recreates the miracle for Peter. He recreates the miracle for Peter to say this, the relationship is still open. Like you're not too far gone. The calling that I had on you then is still the calling that I have on you today. Will you come back? And after Peter heard the words, that's the Lord, you know what Peter did? Peter stood up, he had his shirt off, he put on his clothes and jumped in the water and started swimming. I mean, who does that? Who puts back on their clothes to go swimming? This guy was a mess. But you know what he wanted? He was desperate for Jesus. He was a mess. And, and, and whenever you're desperate for Jesus, you come to him messy. You, you come to him messy. When they got back to the beach, I don't know what it looked like. Peter's swimming and the other disciples are rowing beside him. Why are you swimming? This is ridiculous. But they got to back to the beach and Jesus was on the shoreline and he invited them to breakfast. He invited them to breakfast, to sit down and have a meal with them. And whenever they were sitting down at breakfast, they were sitting next to a charcoal fire. Now, here's what I want you to know about a charcoal fire. The only other time that we see charcoal fire together in all of the Bible, the only other time is the moment that Peter denied Jesus three times. Get that. So here they're sitting next to a charcoal fire. And, and Peter, I don't know if he's put two and two together yet. I don't know if that's really happened to this point. But, but then Jesus says this to Peter, Simon, son of John. You know what he's doing there? He's using his, it's like the equivalent of using your full name. You know, when growing up and, and your parents would use your full name, you'd be like, I gotta go. Like my parents would say, Charles Earl Baker, get over here. Charles Earl. His name is Charles Earl. It's sophisticated yet redneck. <laughs> That's why they call me Chase. So it's the equivalent of saying, Charles Earl Baker. It's Simon, son of John. I need you to pay attention to me. I need you to look me in the eye right now because I've got something important to share with you. Simon, son of John, verse 15, he said, he said, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then he said again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, he answered. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, well, take care of my sheep. A third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus acted, asked him a third time. How many times did he deny him? How many times did he ask the question? Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. 
He did three times, three denials. And I was thinking, well, was Jesus just being mean right here? Was he bringing up past wounds? Why was he bringing it up? Here's how we know that Jesus wasn't being mean because he didn't focus on the past. He looked towards the future. You see, if he was being mean, he would say, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, why did you deny me? But he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Go feed my sheep. Forget it. I've covered it. I've covered it. See, he, he didn't recreate that moment to hurt Peter. He created that moment to heal Peter. See, God will often take us back to our, the moment of our greatest wound, not to hurt you, but to heal you. Maybe some of you need to hear that today. A statement a parent made, an approval that you never got, Re- regret, past sins. These things that we can hold on can dominate our nows and destroy our tomorrows. And what Jesus wants to do is redeem, restore, and make whole. Peter's response, yes, was willful dis- disobedience. He did that. But Peter humbly received. He humbly received. The th- same thing that, that was offered to Peter was offered to Judas. But they had very different responses. And what, what God is wanting us to do is be like Peter and humbly receive the grace that he's given to us. And that grace does not run out. God doesn't want us to live in shame, but move forward in his grace to not allow past to dictate our future. There's lots of ways that we can respond to Jesus. Which one is it for you? You know, maybe you're coming to the point in your life, you're like, man, this devotion stuff, man, I want to be fully devoted. What would it look like for me to take that next step in fully devoting, whether that's financially or socially, or, or maybe, maybe it's dealing with some criticism. What does it look like for me to deal with opposition and love like Jesus love? Or maybe you're, you're the person in the room that's, man, you're, you're opposed. My only challenge to you is give it a shot. See what Jesus can do in your life. Or maybe you've failed. You think you're a failure. You're living in shame and guilt. Whatever that looks like in your situation. Jesus is saying, you don't have to live in it. Come running back to me. I offer grace. I offer love. I want you to live for so much greater, something so much greater. Father, we love you. We're grateful for today. We're grateful for what your word is teaching us. We're grateful for the gift of salvation that comes only through your son, Jesus. We're grateful that you didn't give up on us. God, I pray that our response to you would be reckless love, would be selfless devotion. God, thank you for loving us so deeply. In Jesus' name, amen. The ushers may come down to the front as we continue our morning uh, worship by way of giving. And uh, and guys, we're going to be, pastoral staff's going to be down here, a prayer team. If you want to pray with anybody today, we'll be down here ready to receive you. Um, Before we uh, go uh, take our offering, uh, we're about to show a video of a, a ministry that we're doing here at the church. It's been doing, we've been doing it for a while. It's, it's care ministry. And, um, and God is doing some incredible things in care ministry. In fact, uh, one of the, the people that were baptized, you know, the granddaughter baptized grandmother, uh, grandmother was in care, care ministry. And you're going to hear her story. And uh, if you come from a place where I, I'm broken, or maybe you know somebody, this is probably for them. Uh, don't miss the opportunity um, to share this with them. Let me pray for our offering. God, Use these gifts to advance your kingdom. Thank you for these gifts. Thank you. It's because of these gifts that we're able to do things like care night. Um, God, use it um, to advance your kingdom all over this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Watch this video. When I found care night, um, I was going through a rough time. 
I started Grief Share because my husband passed away from cancer. I was struggling. My kids were watching me struggle. I've never lived alone in my life. It was all new and not pleasant. When I came to Care Night, um, my marriage of 10 years was ending and I was feeling very uncertain. I was feeling lost. I was feeling like I was alone. I needed someone to come alongside me. So the divorce care class through Care Night just really helped me so many ways. It gave me a community of people that I could share with that already knew what was going on in my life. They understood. And being able to just have people know what you went through, know what, what they went through, and be able to walk each other through that grief is absolutely amazing. The first two meetings I sat through and thought, okay, do I really belong here? Is this really gonna help? And by the third meeting, I actually couldn't imagine never having Tuesday nights. And by coming to Grief Share, I, God has worked through me some miracles because I have set up getting ready to be baptized and I am starting a woman's group and I'm starting to feel like I have a life and God is pointing me in the right direction and, and showing me that He has another purpose for me. We feel safe. Um, we feel seen. We feel loved. We feel like just protected and cherished. And it led my children from not knowing if God was real to saying that they want to be baptized. Doing divorce care, I realized that I wanted to continue with single and parenting and, um, and then join the church. I just want you to know that God does not speak to us in fear. Give it three meetings and um, see what God does with your life from there. It's incredible. Let's give that a... <clears throat> I mean, God is doing amazing things. And if you know of anybody that could benefit from Care Night, please let them know. Pass the word. It's really incredible. Now, we are approaching the beginning of school, by the way. And so uh, August 7th for us, and we're going to talk about it more over the, over the weeks, is promotion, or we call it Move Up Sunday for us, where your child is going to another grade. Just know that that is coming. And, and, um, and also, we have uh, one of our last camp of the summer leaves today. Our fourth and fifth graders leave today for summer camp. Really excited for them. Uh, there's about 70 uh, kids going to, to kids camp this week. Um, so uh, we have lots of things. The other thing that I want to tell you about is um, high school uh, ministry. If you're a part of a high school ministry, you have a high schooler that, um, that you're trying to figure out, hey, how do they get connected? Um, if you go over to the student center right after this, John, our new high school pastor, would love to meet you and, uh, and interact with you and get you connected to high school ministry. Guys, we love you. I I'm grateful for you, and I'm grateful to be in church with you today. We're family. Uh, will you stand? Let me pray a prayer of blessings over you. Father, I pray that we leave as changed people forever been changed by your words. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Thank you so much. Friends, we love worshiping with you on Sundays. Now, will you consider taking a next step in your faith? Ladies, maybe that looks like you joining one of our online midweek groups, or maybe that's you taking our online explore class. Whatever it may be, we'd love to help you take a next step in your faith journey. Well, have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you back here next Sunday.